Hello fellow truth seekers, this is Barbara Jean. Uh, so this is part three of what I wanted to talk about today. And I want to talk about the Grace Church some more because I think, like I said, I needed to get this out because I think it's un uh, important to understand why uh, the Grace Church, um, they expect, they're expecting to be raptured uh, when, Christ, when Christ comes back for his bride. But I'm going to tell you right now, they will not be part of that rapture. It will not be part of who they uh, Christ has called them for. Now, I'm not saying that they won't be saved, and I'm not saying that God is not going to protect them through the uh, tribulation, because he will. Those who are truly anointed with the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit will be protected from the Antichrist system. Um, and I'm going to talk about that now. Briefly, um, those who, if you haven't seen my figurines, I'm sure you briefly tell you about these figurines. I was... Um, as I said, uh, 12 years ago, I was called, almost 12 years ago now, I was called to this ministry for the bride. Um, but a couple, of, two or three years before that, I had bought some figurines. Now, they were sitting on my dresser, the figurines here. They were sitting on my dresser for at least two or three years before the Lord called me to this ministry. And the reason I bought them is because I thought they were so cute. And they were in my local drugstore. And there were 12 of them, and I'm, I'm still kicking myself for not getting all 12. But it was meant for a reason. It was, that was done for a reason, although I didn't know it at the time. It was just a prophetic sign the Lord gave me. <laughs> I still wish I had all 12, which would have been interesting if I had all 12 of these figurines. But then I wouldn't have been able to see that the Lord called me to understand the seven churches, to be able to, under, to interpret the seven churches. He gave me this ministry. When he pointed these seven figurines out to me that I had on my, sitting on my dresser, it was at that moment because I was starting, I was on YouTube at that point, and I decided to talk a little bit about some of the things the Lord had revealed to me about the book of Revelation, and particularly the seven churches. And it was then that the Lord pointed out these seven figurines that I had sitting on, on my dresser that had been sitting there for at least two or three years before, and said, it said, go take a closer look at those figurines. I, I couldn't believe it. I walked over and I started rearranging these figurines, which are the days of the month. This is January. But I only had seven of them because I, at the time they were on sale and only picked up seven. And then I was kicking myself for not picking up more. I went back, they were all gone. There was nothing left. The, the figurines were gone. And I was just like so mad at myself for not having picked up more when I could have bought more of these figurines. And I ended up with only seven. Well, then when I looked at these figurines and I started rearranging them when the Lord told me to go look at these figurines closer, and I started to rearrange them, I found out they matched the seven churches. And it was a shock to me. It was a confirmation for me to realize the Lord had given me a gift, a gift of interpretation for this book of Revelation that that was missing, that he, he gives people gifts. And my gift was to interpret the book of Revelation, particularly the seven churches, to understand in depth why seven churches, which, of course, corresponds with the whole outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Proverbs who sets up her pillars seven pillars in the church she's setting up her house of seven, seven pillars and we are doing the same we're setting up a house of seven pillars so each one of these figurines goes corresponds with one of the churches this is my figurine she's January and she corresponds with the first day of the week creation and she also represents the coming of light let there be light. She's wearing a white outfit. Let there be light. And she represents the first day of creation. She represents the first pillar. She represents the church of Ephesus, the first church mentioned. Okay? She's 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 very righteous, but she's also very cold. She's, she's a little bit without love, which the Lord tells her that. But I'm not going to go through. My, my purpose of this video isn't talking about my seven figurines because I've gone over many, 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 many times. But just if you haven't seen them before, I'm just going to briefly tell you this is my first figurine. She represents the Church of Ephesus. She's January. The second church is the Church of Smyrna. She represents the persecuted church. She's got her umbrella because she's got, um, she's, she's the baby's holding an umbrella. Each one of these figurines is holding a baby. Um, and she's got a, um, a, a milk bottle, a, a baby bottle in her pocket. Represents immaturity, dying in immaturity. Represents pain and sorrow, which is, of course, the umbrella because it's raining. But also represents fruitfulness. And each one of these figurines also represent, of course, the rainbow 
just seven. There are seven colors in the rainbow, and each one of them correspond with the rainbow. And each part of the rainbow represents a certain part of the body which each church is um, uh, dominant, dominant in. Okay, the Church of Ephesus, Ephesus is the red. It represents the feet, the leg. It represents the power, strength, physical energy. Um, the second church represents reproduction. It's the Church of Smyrna. The woman's um, cycle. It's, yeah, so each one of these churches are, 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 um, are dominant in particular one particular color of the rainbow, which represents the whole body, which is a feminine figure. It's a feminine figure in here. The third church is and the third church is the church of Pergamos, which is the seat of where the seat of Satan resides, which is of course where the when you when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil lodged in the stomach. And that's the church of Pergamos. You've got the church of uh, the faith church, which is green here, which represents the heart. And I, like I said, I've gone through all these things, but that's the faith. The, the heart of the Lord is faith, and it represents works and rebirth and, and growth. And it's faith. Faith is the growth of the church. Um, we have uh, the works, the works of the church. Then we have the communication and the oxygen of the church, which is grace. That's the church of Sardis. It's blue. Then you've got the dark blue or the indigo, which represents the spiritual understanding, the third eye. Which represents the third eye here. That's with the, the pineal gland right here. That's the third eye. It represents the Church of, per, of uh, Philadelphia. Then you have the crown, which is marriage. It's the marriage color of uh, red and uh, red and blue together, purple, royalty, the crown right here, which represents the Church of Laodicea, the crown and glory of the Lord. Um, the Church of Passion, the Church of Marriage. Okay, so. Uh, so anyway, I showed you the Church of Smyrna. This is my Church of Pergamos, which is the pagan church, the church of the mixed, that's mixed uh, Christian theology with paganism. And she's wearing her Christmas outfit. She's got holly in her hair, and the baby's holding a holly leaf. Okay, there she is. Then I have my fourth church, which is the Faith Church. And she loves things that grow. She's a worker. She works. She's got her her gardening outfit on. And she's got her shoes on. She's got her garden hat on. It's got flowers. The baby's holding flowers. She's about growth. She's about working. She's a work. She's a, she loves to work. Bit of a workaholic. Workaholic. Um, then we have the fifth church, which represents grace, the grace of God, the rest from works. She's got her sun outfit on. She's ready for the beach. Baby's holding a five-pointed star, which is a starfish, and she's ready to play in the ocean. You have the sixth church, and she's wearing her, her pink outfit, which is my favorite color. That's not particular, but she's got a bag full of hearts. The baby's holding a heart. And she's got she's she's um, she's got a dress that's got underneath his stripes. We are healed by his stripes. By his stripes we are healed. There it is right there. And she's wearing pink boots. <laughs> so cute. Pretty adorable. Anyway, she's 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 my favorite. She's she represents the Church of Philadelphia, brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia means, brotherly love. You shall know my you shall know them by their love. Um, from the sixth church, I mean the seventh church of the Church of Laodicea, and there she is. She's being blown by in the wind. She's also wearing stripes, but her stripes are vertical, and and the other um, the Church of Philadelphia, her stripes are horizontal. But she's being blown in the wind. The baby's holding a black ribbon, which is the spirit of death, and she's she's being tribulated. She's being tribulated as a, a as the fig tree is being shaken. The fig tree is being shaken, and the fruit is falling off the tree, and uh, uh, because it's being blown about by in tribulation. Okay, she's got her money purse on her. She's holding her money bag. Okay, so she is ready for tribulation. So those are my my seven figurines. Now I wanted to talk about the fifth fifth church again because I, my sister uh, a few months ago now asked said to me you know uh, uh, challenged me basically to equate the seven churches because the seven is the number for perfection, it's God's number for, for perfection. It's a very important number. And if you see the number seven, it's keep watch it. Like for instance with the red heifer. The, the, the ritual of the red heifer, once you have spilled her blood, 
and she's to cleanse the temple, they they sprinkle the entranceway to the temple seven times with the blood of the red heifer. Seven times. Is it a coincidence? It's not a coincidence. Nothing is a coincidence in the Bible. It's amazing. So my anyway, my sister challenged me to see whether I could get the seven churches to match the seven days of the week. Well, at first I found it a little bit iffy, and then all of a sudden I went, oh, it matches. The, the days of the week match each of the churches. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing um, uh, revelation. It was an amazing revelation to discover that the seven days of the week matched each of the churches. And as I've told you before, the seven seals match each of the churches as well. Each one of the seals match one of the churches, match the church in which it's corresponded to. And so do the days of the week. Now, this is why I want to go over the seventh, the fifth day, the fifth church, which is the grace church. Those who are saved by grace, not by works, lest any man should boast. And they're saved by grace, and not by works. And what is this church, this church doing? They're playing in the sand. They don't have works. Those who are playing in the sand are not building anything that's permanent. They want to build, they want to play, 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 play. They only want the fun of church, churchedom, churchium, church, church, <laughs> churchios, churchiology. They want to play. They don't want the work of church. They don't want the work of God. They want the play of God. Now, God isn't really mad at them for that, but at the same time, he's telling them, if you're not going to work, at least keep your garments clean. Keep your garments clean. There's a few things that you need to do to keep your garments clean. Don't eat things that are don't don't eat things that are sacrificed to idols. Don't drink blood and abstain from fornication. These are the least you can do to maintain cleanliness so that you'll be acceptable in the Grace Church. Now, the Lord loves the Grace Church. I'm not going to say he doesn't. He loves the Grace Church. In fact, he gives them a high honor because they walk closer to the throne. They walk closer to the throne. This is them right here. The color blue, the color of the sky, the color of the ocean, the color of the water, blue. They, this is them right here. This is them. They walk closer to the throne. Here's the throne up here. They walk closer to the throne than those who are in the Church of Ephesus. Those who are down here. They're the, they're found, our foundation. They're just as important, but they don't walk as close to the throne. They don't walk as close to the throne. They, they, they walk closer to the throne than the church of Ephesus. Now, <clears throat> why they are not going to be raptured with the bride, there is an important reason. Now, I've told you this before. There are two groups of people who are blessed by the cross. When, as you remember, and I told you this before, Jacob blessed two of Joseph's sons. Oh, he only had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim was the younger, Manasseh was the older. When he, when Joseph went to see his father when he was dying, you'll find this in the book of Genesis, at the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph, Jacob was dying, and Joseph brought his two sons to be blessed of his father. Joseph, Jacob loved Joseph so much that he wanted to honor him with a double blessing. But he did something very unusual, which I never heard, ever heard anybody explain why. He always, I've always heard many people talk about that he did it, but no one ever, ever explained the riddle as to why he did it until the Lord explained it to me not too long ago, a couple years ago. When he caused his arms and he blessed Ephraim, the younger, with the greater portion of the blessing, and he blessed Emasa with the, with the blessing as well, he crossed his arms and he grafted them as a wild branch who were born in Egypt to a, an Egyptian uh, woman who was Gentile, this Gentile African woman, to bless them and graft them as a wild branch into Israel 
They were grafted in directly under his lineage as though he was the son. They were the son uh, of like Reuben or Simeon or Naphtali or, you know, Judah, whatever. They were given this, this blessing of being grafted into Israel directly under Jacob. And he crossed his arms in when he did it. He crossed his arms. And when he crossed his arms, he gave the greater blessing to Ephraim and the lesser blessing to Manasseh. What was the blessing? The blessing was the blessing of Abraham. He gave the Abrahamic blessing, the same blessing that he coveted from his brother e that was um, was supposed to be given to um, uh, his brother Esau. But he coveted the blessing. He wanted the birthright. He wanted the blessing. And he he stole it, basically. He, he stole the blessing. And so therefore, then when Isaac blessed him, with the blessing, he gave him the Abrahamic blessing. And so now Jacob was doing the same thing. He was giving Joseph the blessing through his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. But the greater portion of the Abrahamic blessing went to Ephraim. Okay, so these two sons were given the Abrahamic blessing through the cross. This is an important symbol. Because we who were grafted in as a wild olive branch into Israel, not physical Israel, we weren't grafted into the fig tree people. We were grafted into the spiritual tree, the olive tree. Remember in no Moses, excuse me, and when Noah sent out the dove, the she dove into the world, she came back with an olive branch. She represents the Holy Spirit bringing the olive branch, who is Jesus Christ, the tree of life. And we are grafted into Israel through the Holy Spirit and the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ. And we are grafted as the wild olive branch into the olive tree through the cross. Through the cross. Okay? That's why that was so important. We never understood it. And now I understand it. The riddle was now solved as to why he did that to show us that all who come to the cross, baptized believers and unbaptized believers, all who come to the cross will be blessed through the cross. Okay. Now, it's a mouthful. The reason this church is not going to be rapturable to the temple is because they are not perfect. You're made perfect when you are obedient to water baptism. Jesus says, let's just go there. Let's just go there. Because I know that you just, I don't know why people are not taught these things. John 3, you must be born again. A Pharisee, Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night and wants to know why Jesus has the power to do the things he does. We know you're you know, a teacher. You've done all these miracles. How is it? Why, do you, why is that possible? And then Jesus tells them, basically, this is how you do it. This is the same thing when Jesus, when the, when the Pharisees, hold on just a second. I'm blowing my nose. When the Pharisees were, were questioning Jesus and saying, by what authority do you do all these things? And Jesus said, well, I answer them if you tell me what authority that Jesus, that John the Baptist was baptizing. What, 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 what authority did he do, do that in? And basically he was answering their question. He said, basically he was telling them, although well, they didn't understand it, they didn't get it, but he was telling them a riddle that the authority in which he was given to do the miracles he was doing was through the water baptism of G that John the Baptist gave him. That's the, that was the authority. John the Baptist got his authority to baptize to, from God the Father. He was given that authority. And when Jesus was baptized in the baptism of John, John the Baptist and came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him and he was, he was declared, that, you know, given approval by his father. And then he was given the authority to go and do the miracles that he did. Okay? He didn't do the miracles before that. He didn't do them because he didn't have the authority to do it until that moment. 
And then it was after that that he had the authority to do those miracles through the Holy Spirit that indwelled him and the, the approval of his father. And then he was able to do the things he did. And he was telling them right off, right when they were questioning him. The, the reason why I had the authority to do these things is because I was baptized in the baptism of John. And that gave me the authority, but they didn't get the riddle. They didn't understand it. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, the same kind of person, the, the Pharisee, you asking me how I have the, you know, I'm able to do all these miracles? Well, it's because I was born again. And in order, if you want to be born again and do the things that I do, you have to do the same thing. You have to get into the waters of baptism and come up in newness of life. And then you will be indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And then you will have the authority to do these same things. Which he says to us in Matthew and Mark. And, and, and at the end of Matthew and Mark where he talks about water baptism. Go into all the world and baptize them. And if once you baptize them, they will have the authority to do these things. Which is what he's saying here to this Pharisee. Fairly, fairly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says unto him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Good question, Nicodemus. And the answer is yes. Not your mother of flesh, but your mother of spirit, your spiritual mother, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus answered and verily said unto him, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's a riddle, Nicodemus, figure it out. It's not that hard. If you're a ruler of, of, of Israel, you should understand this. You should get it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it lists, and no hears the sound thereof, but cannot tell from whence it comes and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. And Nicodemus then answers, how can these things be? He was confused. His mind couldn't, couldn't fathom what he was talking about. Jesus was like marveling that he didn't understand. Jesus answered and said, Art thou a master in Israel? Knows not these things? Verily I say unto you, we speak of things we know and testify of things we see, and we receive, and we receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how can you believe when I tell you of heavenly things? If you don't understand the physical manifestation of the spiritual truth, me telling you spiritual truth is not going to register in your mind. I accept the physicality of these things. Look at the physical, look at the natural order. This is a witness to what's going on in the spiritual realm. It's not that hard. You're making it more difficult for yourself by believing things that you, oh, it's too much to, no, no, it's not that hard. Jesus is marveling at this teacher of Israel who doesn't get it. He says, this is so simple. It's simple, it's easy, it's not hard, but you're making it hard for yourself by complicating it with all kinds of things that don't matter. So then, of course, everyone loves John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His only born Son, begotten Son. Jesus is his God's only born Son. That's what begotten means. We use the word begotten because it seems to crowd people's minds. They don't get it. Jesus, God's only born Son, is Jesus. The only one who was born of the free woman. And then we know this is talking about wild baptism because when you go to the end of the chapter, you read, you see John the Baptist who baptized Jesus in the Jordan in the first place, who was having this discussion with his disciples and saying, they were saying, well, we're, they were complaining and saying that Jesus and his disciples are in the, are at the river Jordan and they're baptizing more people than you. What are we going to do about it? And John the Baptist said, hey, that's a good thing. That's the way it should be. He's the bridegroom. I'm only the friend of the bridegroom. He's doing what the bridegroom is doing. He's calling his bride through this process. He's baptizing them in order for them to be cleansed and made perfect so that they are the bride. They are equally yoked through him through this, this method. This is the God God has chosen to authorize through John, through me, through this method to, to betroth those who will be made clean and made perfect and equally yoked with Christ Jesus through this process so that they will be made perfect through Christ Jesus to be his bride. They will be given in marriage to Jesus through this process. This is their betrothal. Okay? Now, you have this Grace Church who don't love works in fact they hate works and in fact you bring up works they'll do everything in their power to not do it because they hate works that much okay oh. they love the holy spirit but they're not fond of the law okay 
Um, they like to play. They don't like to work. Revelation chapter 3, we read about the Grace Church. They're the fifth church. The fifth, they represent the fifth day. Let's just actually read first. Let's read about the fifth day in Genesis first. And the fifth day of creation, um, in the fifth day of creation, it starts at Revelation, uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 20. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, abundantly the moving creatures that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living thing, creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after their kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply, fill the waters in the sea. Keep that phrase in mind and fill the waters in the sea and let every fowl multiply in the earth. So this is about water and air and the creatures that fill the water and the air. And then little figurine, she's wearing a blue striped dress. She's barefoot, she's ready to play in the water, in the sand and in the water, trying to keep her garments clean while she's doing it. And the baby's holding a five pointed starfish. There it is right there. She's ready for it to play in the sand. You have my fifth day, here's my, my my chart, which is the fifth church. She represents air, oxygen. You're breathing into your lungs. She re represents communication. She represents water and air. She's blue here. Represents oxygen. When you're breathing in oxygen, it's full of water. Air is full of water. The people who live in humid count, uh, uh, climates or have a lot of rain, we know that water's in the air. It's being evaporated from the ocean up into the sky and then travels through the, the, the the clouds and, and then comes down on the earth. The air we breathe is full of water, as well as our bodies. Our bodies are also full of water, but mostly water. Okay, our bodies are mostly water. So here she is, she represents, she's the color blue, she represents the sky and the water, the water above and the water below. Okay, she also represents the fowls in the air that fly in the air, and she represents those who are below in the heavier. A condensation of water, and that would be the ocean. We're in the sea. Okay, let's read about that. So that's what it read Genesis chapter 20, the fifth day. Now we go to the fifth church, Revelation chapter 3, the church of Sardis. Man, I was having trouble, and I told you this before, I was having trouble trying to get the name straight when it came to the church of Smyrna and the church of Sardis. I kept getting them mixed up. Well, I don't get them mixed up anymore because the Lord said to me, I was like, why am I always having trouble getting remembering which church is which? The Sardis and Smyrna, Smyrna and Sardis. I always get them mixed up. And the Lord said, think fish. <laughs> it's not that hard. Think fish. And I went, of course, Sardis, sardines. Sardis, sardines. It's the root word of sardines, the fish. It's the sign of Pisces, the fish. Those who are in the sea. And now let's read about these, these little greasy fish. The, the, people have a name for the, the Grace Church, and sometimes they call them the Greasy Gracers. Because they was they're slippery and they just wanted they want to play in the ocean. They don't want to work. They don't want to do, you know, anything other than work. They play, they, they, they play, play, play. They love play, play, play. They don't want to work, work, work. But listen to what he says about the Grace Church. The little greasy gracers, the little squeezy, the little greasy fishes. And it says unto the angel, unto the angels, the church of Sardis, write these things. Say he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know they work. So they, that has the name that they live is, and are dead. The spirit of death is still on them. And he mentions the seven stars. The baby's holding a star, and the seven spirits. They love the Holy Spirit. They love the Holy Spirit. That's so crazy, but. The father they're not really crazy about the spirit of works they're not really crazy about the law they don't want to know about it. they just want to play they love the holy spirit but you have the reputation that you're alive but you are dead the spirit of death is still on you why because they haven't reconciled to the law 
they have been saved by grace. They're sinners saved by grace. And I love that phrase. They'll tell you things to your face. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And they're right. They are correct when they say it. They are still sinners, but they're saved by grace. And they love to know that. They, they, they don't mind telling you, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Because they haven't reconciled through the law. How do you reconcile through the law? You have to fulfill the law. You can't fulfill the law by yourself. You could have to go to Christ Jesus and get into his finished work, which is done through water baptism. That's the only way to be reconciled to the law. To fulfill the law. But they don't want to be fulfilled. They don't want to fulfill that part. It's like they, they, they were in rebellion to the law. They absolutely so in rebellion to the law. They can't see that... Oh, no, it's a work, it's a work, it's a work. I can't do it. I won't do it. So they, they can't see how important it is. It's like their mind in a mind fog of some sort. And Satan has them so controlled in this area, they don't see that this is the way to be perfect. But they don't want to be perfect. They're satisfied being sinners saved by grace. <sighs> I'm sorry, but it's just the truth. Lord, Lord didn't give me this ministry because I'm politically correct. I'm not a politically correct kind of person. I'm not. That's why he gave me the job. <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not worried about, you know, ma making people happy with what I say. I'm just trying to get you free from the lies of Satan so that you can be perfect in Christ Jesus by doing what he tells you, not being rebellious. But you know what? That's another subject for another day because it's hard for me to reconcile that. Being part of the bride, it, it, it's hard for me to not understand, for me to understand somebody who's not willing to take that step to perfection. But there's just people who cannot go there. Now, God does have, I'm not saying they can't be saved because the Bible does say they can be saved. But I'm, I'm telling you that to me, this doesn't make sense. If you can have perfection, why settle for being a fish? But they'd rather be a fish. I, I don't get it. But anyway, let's just finish to what I'm going to say here. I know they work though, has the name that thou livest, and are dead. The spirit of death is still on them because they're not made perfect. The spirit of life hasn't been, they haven't been renewed with newness of life through water baptism. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain and are ready to die. For I have not found my works perfect before God. You're not perfect. You're not perfect. That's why you can't be that's why you can't be resurrected to the temple because there's no spirit of death in the temple. There's only life in the temple. There's only life in the temple. There is no smidgen, even a high odor or a hint of death in the temple of God. Only life. I have not found my works perfect. Uh -oh. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Or else if thou shalt not watch, I will come to thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. When did we see the thief? Oh yeah, the thief on the cross who had no opportunity to get down off the cross and do the right thing. He was saved by grace. And this is one of their role models. For the Grace Church is their role models, the thief on the cross. They love the thief on the cross. And I mean, I'm not saying I have nothing bad about the thief on the cross. Thank God that he was saved. And thank God there's an example of salvation at the last moment. Thank God there is. But this is what he's saying to them. The thief on the cross didn't have the opportunity to get off the cross and get make it right. To make it right. And they have works prepared for the Lord to 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 gain a reward. He had new opportunity. And Jesus is saying, if you don't repent and take care of the things that are that need to be changed in your life, I'm going to come upon you like that thief when you're on the point of death and you have no works to show. Because you've been so busy playing in the sand and getting your garments dirty and you had no thought about what you had to present to the Lord as a sacrifice. And you had nothing to prepare and if you don't take care of that, I'm going to come upon you like the thief. 
Thou hast a few names, even as Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name in the book of life, which, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, we see this group of people, and they're told that they're dead. They have the reputation they're alive, but they, the spirit of death is still on them. When you go to the fifth seal, let's go now to the fifth seal, and you will see what I'm saying. Each one of these churches, each one of the seals, verse number seven, correspond with each one of the churches. When you go to the fifth seal, what do you see at the fifth seal? When he opens the fifth seal in Revelation chapter six, This is what it says. Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls, not the bodies, not the raptured bodies, but the souls, the disembodied spirits, people who have died, were in their spirit, they are now in this, their soulish condition, and they're under the altar talking to the Lord. And the, sin, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood, um, our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them, They should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed, it was the spirit of death, as they were, should be fulfilled. They're told in the church of Sardis, the church of the fish, that they had to wait. They would be given white Roman, wrote a white clothes to wear if they keep their garments clean. And then in the fifth seal, they're told they're given white robes and they're, they're dead. And he tells the, the, the fifth church, the church of Sardis, you have the reputation of your life, but you're dead. And he tells these souls who are dead, you have to wait until everybody who's died like you, who's had, who goes through, you know, who's going to be saved by grace, who go through the process of dying. You have to wait till everyone who is going to, and of course, that's not going to happen until at the end, the end of the millennium. Because guess what, people? Death is still in the millennium. There's still death in the millennium. People will still die during the thousand year reign. So therefore, death isn't swallowed up until after the thousand year reign when the book of life is open after the thousand year reign he tells the church of sardis you will not your name will you'll be given a white robe which is what he does in the fifth seal they're given a white robe people who die in the grace church they go to heaven and they're given a white robe to wear okay they are they're given a white robe because they kept their, gar their garments clean but then they're not coming he tells them right here you are not to be raptured. You're not going to be. You're not going to be raptured, and nor do you get a new body until the book of life is open. When all who are going to die, as you have died, die. Yeah, hold on. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. My sister came to collect the dog. Oh, I can't remember exactly where it was that I was talking about. So anyway, I'm just continuing what I was kind of. I don't remember exactly where I left off, but uh, so he's, he, he's in the fifth seal. He's telling them that they have to wait until all who die as they did with the same spirit of death that has controlled them. As he says in the fifth uh, church, that they have the reputation they're alive, but they are dead. And they don't even know it because there is a certain spirit of death on them that still controls them. Jesus doesn't come and set them free from that spirit of death until the book of life is opened. When all who die, and I'm going to get to this in a second, I'm going to show you this. We, we see that they are held in this state of, of, so God's going to give them those who die in this, in, 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 because they're sinners saved by grace, they will be given white robes if they keep their garments clean, which represents that they have been 
faithful to the Lord in their testimony of being saved by grace, being sinners saved by grace, they will be given a white robe. But they are not perfect. And they have to wait to for their redeem, redeemed bodies until death has been conquered. Con death isn't conquered until after the millennial reign. And I will show that to you. I can prove it to you. It is not that hard to find. It's very, very obvious and out in the open. It's there. It says it quite clearly. Death isn't defeated till after the millennial reign. People will still be dying during the millennial reign. Okay, not abortion. There will be no abortions. No abortions. People will live very, very, very long lives, but death is still not done. These people have to wait. Those who are saved by grace, sinners saved by grace, have to wait until all who die as they did is fulfilled. The reason the, the bride can be taken is because the spirit of death has been removed from her. She is no longer considered a sinner when you have been baptized into Christ Jesus. And I will prove that to you too, in case you don't know where it is, Romans 6. When you are baptized into Christ Jesus, you leave the old man of sin behind. And as far as God is concerned, when he sees you, he doesn't see death. He sees life. He only sees life. He sees his son. He sees new birth. He sees, Jesus said, you must be born of the water and of the spirit in order to what? See the kingdom. To see the kingdom as he sees the kingdom. Full of life. But as, you, as long as you have any smidgen of death, lies, deceptions, untruth in you, and you have not re repented and brought them to, to the redemption of the law, which is Christ's finished work, in the law, then you are still under the spirit of death to some point, to some degree, you will still be judged according to that law. And so therefore God is telling them, this, this is just, this is right, this is true, this is the truth, this is justice. You must wait till all who will be die, who will die under the testimony of Christ Jesus, under grace, sinners saved by grace, you have to wait till all who are going to die as you do have died in order for you all to be judged at the same time. Okay? <clears throat> so they're crying out with a loud voice, how long? And they were given white robes and they were told to rest for a season until all who die as they do are, are who, who die, or die. That's what it says, Revelation chapter 11, or 6, uh, 6, 11. Then, uh, let's go, let's go to <clears throat> the book of, uh, of the millennial, but we're after the millennium. I'm going to prove it to you that this is exactly what happens. The thousand year reign is Revelation chapter 20. Jesus comes back with the dead saints, his dead army saints. Who are who are they? Those who didn't take the mark of the beast, and the church of Smyrna, who were promised that they will not see the second death. They will not be the, this, the term second death. The phrase second death is used in the church of Smyrna, and it's, it is also used here when it talks about those who will uh, rule and reign with Christ Jesus. And we see the first resurrection. Remember, it's all about who is going to, those who die as you do. The church of Smyrna die, die as martyrs for their fellow man. They die as martyrs. They spill their blood, their testimony of Jesus Christ. They die. Those who, who have died and spilled their blood, had their heads cut off by not receiving the mark of the beast. They are grouped into this category of the first resurrection because they there nobody else is going to die as they did in other words during the millennial reign there'll be no more martyrs for christ martyrs for for christ will be done you can think about that no more martyrs for christ during the millennial reign so that's why jesus is able to resurrect them at this particular time because that's the group of which they fit their death falls into this category and they are the first to rise after when Christ comes back on the white horse, he brings them with him, their spirits come with them, with him to the earth to be resurrected, to rule on the earth as the martyred saints during that particular time. And he's very specific about it. He's very, it's very specific about who gets the first resurrection. Revelation chapter 20, <clears throat> the thousand year reign. Year reign. Starting at verse four, and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them, the same dead people who died at this particular type of martyrdom, uh, 
Souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, nor received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such, there's this phrase, the second death hath no power but they shall be priests of God in Christ and reign with him for a thousand years. So not all the dead come back to life. Now, that doesn't mean that the, that the Grace Church is not here. The Grace Church, those who are alive through the tribulation, those who make it through the tribulation, will still be here on earth. They will be given. They're still mortal. They're still mortal. Why are they mortal? So that they can give birth through the revelate, through the the millennial reign so that they can continue the population growth they will be given the right they like i said there will be no abortions miscarriage will probably be nothing there'll be never be any miscarriage uh, people will live for very very long long times but they are necessary the mortals those they're not resurrected from the dead yet but those who are lived through the tribulation who have the holy spirit anointing that's, that that goes along with the parable of the ten virgins. Some of five were wise and five were foolish. Five had oil and five did not. Representing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Those who had the anointing of the Holy Spirit are saved through the tribulation. Those who had no Holy Spirit, were not anointing by the Holy Spirit, are going to have to go through the tribulation and they will be the martyred saints. Now, Jesus needs mortal people who were Holy Spirit anointed but not perfect to live through the tribulation. He needs them. Otherwise, there's nobody to repopulate the earth. The bride is taken up to heaven. We're not repopulating the earth here on earth. We're up in our heavenly Jerusalem. We're in our home in the third temple already built for us and made of gold. Why would we come down here? Why would we want to come down? We wouldn't. We have a beautiful home in the heavenly realms and we're not moving. We're not staying there until it comes down to the new earth. That's where that's our home. That's where we stay. But those who are coming back to repopulate the earth are mortal grace people who are anointed with the Holy Spirit. But not all. They're not going to be resurrected till the end. They are not resurrected till all who die as they have are then fulfilled. Those who are written in the book of life. Okay? Now. So this is the first resurrection. Then Satan is defeated. He's thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Jesus is then rules and reigns for a thousand years. But those who had martyred been martyrs, they've gone through the first resurrection. Then we have the great right throne judgment. And this is where I really want to get to. <clears throat> Revelation 20, 11, And I saw the great white throne and him that sat on it from whose the face of the earth and hath fled away and there was found no place in them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was open and this is which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the book according to their works this is when this group of people alive and dead those all come back to life those who are in hell and those who are saved by grace they get their judgment. They get their new bodies. At this time of this whole story, they are not resurrected from the dead until this time. Okay? Because they are still dead. So that's what Jesus says to them in the book of the Church of Sardis. You have the reputation in your life, but you're dead. You don't even know it. You're not perfect. The spirit of death is still on you. Therefore, you have to wait for your resurrected body. And the, this is where I would get to. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So two places, two groups of people are being resurrected at this time. Not the martyr, because they've already received their resurrection. Because all who are going to die during, uh, who've died, for martyrdom in the last 6,000 years are part of the first resurrection. 
there's going to be no more death in that kind of state. I mean, once Christ comes to rule and reign, there'll be no more abortion. There'll be no more wars. There'll be no more persecution of the Christian or the believer. That all comes to an end. It ends. It stops. So therefore, nobody else is going to die like they died. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell get delivered up the dead that were in them. So two groups of people, one's in the sea and the other's in hell. And both re receive the eternal bodies, one for eternal uh, uh, kingdom, the paradise, and the other, the other for eternal damnation, for eternal torture, eternal forever torture, no end. Those who believe that hell is just, you know, once they go into hell, you're burnt up and that's it, you're done. No, it's not the way it is. That's not the way it's described. It's described as eternal. Eternal torture for, forever. That's what it says here. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And the lake of fire doesn't say that, you know, yeah, once you're thrown in there, you're burnt up and that's it. You're burnt to a, a, a cinder and then there's nothing left of, left of you. No, it says you they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's how it's described. And when he opens the book of life, when does he do it? He opens it at the end of the millennial reign. When the church of, of, of Sardis received the reward when the book of life is opened. I hope this is making it very clear. This is not hard to understand. Put the pieces together, people. It's not that hard. When these books are opened, the sea gave up the dead. Who's sitting in the sea? The church, the Grace Church. Think of it this way. The Bible says that when you're baptized into Christ Jesus, you go into the sea. What's in the sea? Our sins are in the sea. When you go into death, burial, and resurrection, when, you, when you're baptized into the water, you're going into the sea. But death is in the sea. Your sins are left in the sea. These are sinners saved by grace. They're still in the sea. There's the fish. They're in the sea. They, it's like they've gone into baptism, but they haven't come up. They haven't come up. They haven't been emerged. They haven't come in to walk, walk in the newness of life. And that's what Jesus said. When you go into the waters of baptism, you go down and you leave your sins there. And then you come up in newness of life. You start, you, you see the kingdom. You're in a different place. You have a different salvation than those who are saved by grace and grace alone. If you're saved by grace and grace alone and without any works, well, guess what, people? You're in the sea. And that's when you're, that's when you're, your judgment comes at the end of the millennia, when you have to wait till after the thousand year reign, when death is finally defeated. De when is death defeated? Not till after the millennial reign. There's still death in the millennial reign. It will be, like I said, people will be living longer lives, but people will still be dying. Death isn't swallowed up until after the millennial reign. And that's when the books of life are finally open, when death is finally defeated. And see, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay. So there it is. There, And then that's when the new heaven and the earth come down. The new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ comes down. And the, and the new Jerusalem, which we who are baptized believers are sealed with the name of the new Jerusalem. Read it for yourself. This is new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And we, it, as the bride... Adorned for her bridegroom. It's the New Jerusalem. Who's, who's, who's sealed with the name of the New Jerusalem? Oh yeah, Church of Philadelphia. That's right. Revelation chapter 3, uh, starting verse 10, Church of Philadelphia. We are sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're sealed with the name of the Father, Jesus' new, new name, and New Jerusalem. We are the bride of Christ, and we are sealed as a bride adorned for her husband, and we're coming and in our new home, we're coming to join the new earth. After they receive their reward. So I think this is pretty plain. I, I, 
you can understand why this is concerning to me and why I keep when I hear people just say just say the sinner's prayer and you'll be saved well they're not giving them the whole story they're not giving them the opportunity to be perfect and be removed from the hour of tribulation which is going to come upon the whole world these these prophets and these preachers and these teachers who know the truth know the truth and do not give their art their congregation the opportunity to be perfect so that they can be removed from the hour of tribulation which is what it talks about the church of philadelphia is going to enjoy to be removed from the hour of tribulation those who come upon the wrath that's going to come upon the whole world they will not have the opportunity because first of all their teachers refuse to teach it who's going to be held responsible for that you wonder those people who knew the truth and didn't tell the truth or those people who didn't know the truth I think if you're a teacher and you're not telling the people the truth about it you're in big doo-doo I'm just saying but God does have a provision for them he will save them through it he promises to he needs them interestingly enough those who are not given the opportunity will be saved through it if you're one of the five wise virgins who has oil in your lap you will be preserved through the tribulation which is what it talks about in revelation chapter 12 the woman in heaven gives birth and then those who are on earth who have the anointing of the holy spirit the testimony of jesus will be preserved for three and a half years during the time and the rule and reign of the antichrist they will be preserved they will be protected so if you will it will be kind of a semi rapture it will not be the rapture of the dead the dead will not receive their new bodies, but those who are alive, who are have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, will be preserved because of the Revelation chapter 12 woman gives birth to a perfect child. Abortion will be done away with forever and ever. There will be no more of that. And those who are mortal, who have the anointing of, of the Holy Spirit on them, will be preserved through the time of the Antichrist and kept safe, which is a very comforting thing to know. It's a very comforting thing to know that if you are an anointed believer, but you have not been baptized and you missed the rapture of the church, you will be kept safe through the, the mark of the beast. You will be preserved. You will be protected. You will, there will be a, some sort of semi-rapture that will occur and you will be taken to a safe place. Your angels will come and get you and take you to a safe place. Isn't that a good thing to know? That's a good thing to know, people. So I think that's all I'm going to say on this, except for to say that those who are in this category are not married to the bridegroom. Okay, they are the virgins. They are, they will be like the angels, neither given in marriage, marrying or given in marriage. Those all who are saved by grace, who have not been made perfect, who have not gone through the the patrol the ritual of baptism, will be like the angels, neither marrying nor given in marriage. You know, but they are the fish and. Lord loves you. I'm not just saying the Lord loves you, but you have the opportunity now. You have the opportunity now to be made perfect and made into a human being, a real true son of God that is not a fish. Why settle for being a fish? Why? Why just why be a fish? And it's interesting that the Church of Philadelphia is talking about humanity, brotherly, this human. It's human. The humanizing church, the church that makes you equal with God, not big G God, but makes you equal, to be equally yoked with God because you've been made perfect through Christ's finished work. It makes you human, it makes you back what Adam and Eve should have been in the garden, only better. Because now you have knowledge, you have the wisdom to go with it, you have the experience to go with it. So Adam and Eve were like children in the garden. They had no experience to, to, to fall back on. But we have the experience. We also have the knowledge of all the things that have gone on in the past to fall back on. We have the experience of David and Solomon and, and, and Joshua and all these people. We have their experience in our minds and our hearts. We have their wisdom embedded in our spirits. Isn't that amazing? We're fully human. We're only better. Better than Adam and Eve. We are more more enlightened than Adam and Eve because we have the blood of Christ Jesus and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff. So I don't like I said, you can you can be content being a fish if that's what you want. 
but it's better to be human. So I think it's all I was in this video. I was going to talk about the sixth church, but I think I'll wait for that for another video and another time. I'm going to jump in the shower and get myself together. And uh, anyway, um, God bless, and I will talk to you later.